Well, there is something that has happened here this morning that perhaps none of us have consciously considered. Every one of us walked through that door. We walked through that door and you walked to where you are now in your seat. You walked. I walked. Every one of us except perhaps for one little one who may have been carried in here. I saw her being carried, I think, by Dad. But every one of us, bar that one exception, walked in through that door. Perhaps most of us took it for granted, didn't even think about it. I knew what I was going to preach on this morning, and I confess I didn't think about it. When I got out of bed this morning and my fit, feet hit that floor in my bedroom, didn't think about it. Did you? so easy, isn't it, for us to take for granted that we can walk. We should all be thankful that we can walk. Perhaps what you don't realise, or what we don't think of very often, is that actually we are all cripples. All of us in one sense can't walk. Imagine what it would be like physically if you couldn't walk. Imagine all the changes that you'd have to make in your life as it is now. Surely there'd be alterations you'd have to make to your home if you're in a wheelchair. There'd have to be alterations perhaps for many of you when it comes to your employment. Your daily routines would change. We should be grateful to God that we can have this physical ability to walk, but we have a spiritual disability. And that is all of us are cripples. All of us spiritually cannot walk in our own strength and by us as we are born into this world. The wonderful thing is though that Jesus welcomes and Jesus receives cripples. In a little bit this morning we're going to come to the table of remembrance for the Lord's Supper. This is a table for cripples. God has designed that the spiritually crippled should come to him, should come even and feast at a table for a banquet. So this morning, friends, what I've entitled, what we're going to consider in the preaching is simply this, a table for cripples. We're putting Mark just on a pause this morning so that we can have this time to meet around the Lord's table. A table for cripples and what I'd like us to do is to see how this Old Testament story in 2 Samuel chapter 9, this story of David dealing with Mephibosheth, it's a wonderful picture of how Christ in his mercy deals with us and how he welcomes us, though we are spiritually crippled, though we are spiritually lame and in a state of misery naturally, yet nevertheless Christ welcomes us, he receives us, he bids us to come and partake of the banqueting table. There are two major divisions of thought that I want us to use as we look at this chapter and, and they will be these. Firstly, we'll think about a condition of misery and then secondly, a demonstration of mercy. And I believe you'll see both of these things very simply in this chapter in 2 Samuel 9. Firstly then, a condition of misery. And the, the man that we want to focus in upon under this first heading is this man with this strange name, Mephibosheth. And I want us to think about his condition as it's presented to us in this story. You see, Mephibosheth cut, cuts a sad picture in the scriptures. His is a state of misery. If you look with me in your Bibles at verse 6 there, you'll, you'll see the opening part of that verse tells us about who this man is. He tells us something about his family, what family he came from. It says that Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul. And that of course means that Mephibosheth is the grandson of Israel's first king, King Saul. And in Mephibosheth's early days, like when he was a little fellow, under the age of five or six, before his father and grandfather died, Mephibosheth, if you think about him in that situation, stood to, to receive a, a, a healthy, wealthy even, inheritance. In 1 Samuel chapter 9 and in verse 1, 
it perhaps suggests that Saul was a wealthy man. Speaking of Saul, in that verse, it says that he is a mighty man of power. Now that Hebrew word power could also be translated wealth. So we could read it in English that Saul was a mighty man of wealth. And yet by the time we get to 2 Samuel chapter 9, Saul's dead. And Mephibosheth's inheritance is long gone. The house of Saul now had little. Their possessions had either been lost or maybe confiscated. They're gone. Mephibosheth, his condition was one of misery. But it's interesting when we take a, a closer look at his name. As I said just before, it's, it's, it's a peculiar name. And his name literally means shameful thing. Now, it's possible, I'm not at all being dogmatic here, but I want to suggest it's possible that Mephibosheth, that that name was like his nickname. Perhaps it was given by someone and, and that, that name that was given by him, which wasn't necessarily given by his mother or father at birth, but was given by someone else along the way in his earlier days, stuck. And, and everyone perhaps began to call him that. Maybe some of you have had nicknames in the past. I have. I'm not going to tell you what they are at the moment. Um, but perhaps you have. And they've risen out of maybe a circumstance or a characteristic of your, of your, of your, your personality. And, and that's what people, particularly your friends, um, began to call you. Well, it's possible that Mephibosheth was his nickname, not at all perhaps the name that appeared on his birth certificate, if, as we would call it, but a name that ends up being the one that everyone called him normally in life. And I say that because when we turn to First Chronicles, in chapters 8 and 9, we're in the midst of the list of names. And remember the Hebrews were very careful about their records of families and, and generations and names and who gave birth to who. They were very careful about that record. It was extremely important to them for, well, we would understand for obvious reasons because of the line uh, and down through Abraham. And the interesting thing is, is when we look to the those, those lists in 1 Chronicles chapters 8 and 9 for the family of Saul, we don't find the name Mephibosheth. We find a character who was the son of Jonathan, and it is this character, but he's not called Mephibosheth. In both places he's mentioned in Chronicles, he's called Merib Baal. And that name simply means Baal's fighter. And yet when we're in the stories, the narratives in 1st and 2nd Samuel, Merib Baal is not used. But speaking about that character, he's called Mephibosheth. So I'm suggesting to you that perhaps it's his nickname. But that's really secondary. It's what his name means. That's the most important thing. His name means shameful thing. Once, he was the potential heir to the throne of Israel. But with his father and grandfather long dead, that has left him... That situation, particularly with Saul falling on his sword, remember the story, the situation now with Saul dead had left Mephibosheth with a shameful record of the horrible, revengeful and the bitter conduct that, that Saul, his grandfather, had displayed toward David all those years earlier. Remember what Saul did to David, what he tried to do? There's a couple of occasions, here's David playing the harp, trying to soothe down the agitation of Saul, and Saul picks up his spear and tries to pin David to the wall. And then the well-known time at the end of Saul's life in um, rain, and David's being chased all around the wilderness like some sort of wild beast by Saul, and Saul simply wants to murder David. That's Mephibosheth's grandfather. That very David, though, now in, one, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, who was so badly treated by Saul, is now king over the land. You see, Mephibosheth bore the family name and possibly the family shame, which perhaps then is reflected in his name, meaning shameful thing. You see, even in the name that he bore, it seemed to carry with it this idea of his condition of misery. But then, friends, we see more than that. We see more than just the family he came from and the name. 
But when we think about where he lived, when we look at the passage and understand the town or the region from where he came, I believe it also points us in the direction to conclude that this man had a condition of misery. Look with me at verses 3 and 4. Partway through this story, it tells us where he comes from. The king makes inquiry, is there not still someone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And he gets the answer back, yes, there's the son of Jonathan. And where is he in verse 4? And the answer comes back where he is. He's in the house of Micaiah, the son of Amiel in Lo Debar. Lo Debar is the name of the town or the region, perhaps the town. And that name, Lodabar, literally means a place of no pasture or pastureless. Now, Lodabar, thinking of geography, was on the opposite side of the River Jordan. It was, a, a, it was away from where Jerusalem was, where, where the king was, where David was in the palace. And perhaps it was that Mephibosheth liked to live in Lodabar, in that place, because he, he maybe he hoped that he'd be forgotten there, where he could maybe escape the potential vengeance of the monarch, who ordinarily in those days, they would try and remove all threats to their throne, especially descendants of a former king. So Mephibosheth dwelt in a place of obscurity. He lived in a place of literally no pasture. You see how even where he lived seems to emphasise and underscore his condition? But perhaps the clearest, the most obvious thing that relates to his condition of misery was his disability. That seems to me is what's emphasised when every time you hear his name you seem to be having this reminded to you in this chapter and in other chapters where he is mentioned in, in Samuel 1st and 2nd he's spoken about when, in terms of his disability. The last sentence in the chapter right at the end of verse 13 it tells us clearly what the state was with him physically. It says he was lame in both his feet. And perhaps when we read that we it maybe conjures up questions in our minds well uh, what happened? Was he born that way? Like, how did this happen? Well, we haven't got a, we haven't got a guess. The Bible tells us the, the story or the accident that happened that caused him to have these injuries. If you turn back to chapter 4 of 2 Samuel, and we only need to read one verse in this chapter, which summarizes the scene of the accident. 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. So it states it, now it explains it. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. That is, the news about that they had died in battle or in the process of the battle. When the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel and his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. So we've got the same character. That's the accident. Now, Josephus, the Jewish historian, gives, a, gives what I think is an interesting comment. It's probably just Jewish um, history or some sort of Jewish tradition. It's not at all scriptural uh, authority, but it's nevertheless an interesting thing that could have been true. He said this about the nurse, she snatched him up and fled away and let him fall from her shoulders and his feet were lame. So maybe it was in the scurry of fear and trying to get away with the news, the death of Mephibosheth's father and grandfather ringing in her ears. Here's this nurse. She, she whisked him up to escape any perhaps potential attempt on the young, king, young prince, the five-year-old boy's life. She wants to get him away to safety. And yet in the process of fleeing, what happens? There's a fall. And as a result of the fall... Mephibosheth is left in a, in a crippled state all his days. He's lame, we're told in our passage, in both his feet. He can't walk. He's a cripple. And yet even some years later, as it comes out in chapter 19 of 2 Samuel, Mephibosheth still is lame. And yet he still, even then, years later, requires that his feet have constant care, probably referring to the fact that his feet needed to be regularly bandaged. 
which conjures up ideas like were there continually gaping wounds, oozing wounds, like what, what had happened? It's, it's a severe injury. You see how Mephibosheth cuts a very sad picture in the scriptures. That fall as a little boy all those years ago had left him crippled for life. You see, when we put all these things together, I'm sure you can see that they all add up to a condition of misery. Let me put it to you in this way. We put these things together. When we consider his former fame, when we understand the definition of his name, when we learn about the place from where he came, and when we know him as a man who was lame, all of that adds up to a condition of misery. Those four things that rhyme. When we consider his former fame, when we understand the, na the definition of his name, when we learn about from where he came, and when we know that this was a man who was lame, that all concludes a man in a condition of misery. I think that many of us here this morning can identify with Mephibosheth on many, if not all of those points. Because the Bible tells us that like Mephibosheth, we are victims of a squandered inheritance. You think about it. Our father, Abe Adam, was given so much. He was made in God's image. He was given the privilege of fellowshipping with God. Adam, the first man, was the representative of mankind. What he did counted for all of us. We know the story, don't we? He disobeyed God. That commandment that God had given to him, he disobeyed God. And when he did that, he threw everything else away. The image of God was marred. Fellowship with God was broken. The way to eternal life was barred. And in its place, a sentence of eternal death was given. Friends, our inheritance was lost. And when we were born into this world, I want to suggest to you it was as if we were born to be raised in the very same town that Mephibosheth was, Lodabar. From our earliest days, we, chose, we choose the path of disobedience. Not once did your parents, not once did my parents have to teach me or teach you how to disobey. It's in all of us. Not once did they have to teach us that word no. As parents we have to teach the word yes. <laughs> but it's in all of us. Right from the very beginning, from the youngest age. We came into this world, we came with a heart problem. We came with a corrupt nature. We grew up in low Debar. Our lives outside of God are so barren. But we live a life of obscurity that is by nature we live far from the presence of the King of Heaven and we choose to live that way. That's what we want by nature. We live in our own little world. A world cut off from the King we think. It's a life of no real pasture. Yet we're born into this world not only to be raised in that sense the same town, it's like we're given the same name. Now it's true that we all have a different name. Your birth certificate is going to be different to mine and the person next to you. We've got different names. But we've all got the same nickname, spiritually. We're all born into this world with the name Mephibosheth as our nickname, shameful thing. And I say that because Isaiah 64 and verse 6 says these words. But we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Not one of us escapes that clause. We are all an unclean thing. Now, everyone tries to kid themselves and think, well, I'm a fairly good person. You know, we'll puff our chest up and pat ourselves on the back and 
when God weighs up my good with my bad, I mean, he will see that my good, it outweighs my bad and he'll let me into heaven. That's something that often is there with all of us, I would say. But when we think that way, we actually forget who we are. We forget what our name is. We forget our nature, that we are all an unclean thing. You see, it's not just the terrorists in Pakistan. It's not just the arsonists in Victoria. It's all of us who have a corrupt nature. We are all an unclean thing. The best that we can present to God is a filthy rag in God's sight. You see, our name is a shameful thing. We may not feel comfortable about that. We may not necessarily want to hear that, but that's what the Bible teaches. That's us. It's humbling, but it's true. And friends, you and I were born into this world with a serious disability. Yes, we were born into this world with a sinful nature that we inherited through Adam. We were born with no ability whatsoever to please God in what we do. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Cannot. It's not possible when we are in the flesh, in our natural state, to please God. We can't. You see, we all have a major spiritual disability. Using the analogy that comes out of this passage, we, we are spiritual cripples. And again, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, describing us that we are people without strength. That the bones and our ankles, as it were, the, the, the feet, where, wherever the problem was with Mephibosheth, for us spiritually, we don't have strength to walk in the ways of God. We're lame in both our spiritual feet. We are unable to run in the path of God's commandments. We have this spiritual disability. We cannot tread the narrow path which leads to life. We can't do it. How come? Well, it's a little bit like Mephibosheth. It's all got to do with the fall that happened so long ago. We lost the ability to walk in the way to please God because of that fall. As Mephibosheth was physically crippled through a literal fall, well, we are spiritually crippled because of Adam's fall. When Adam fell into sin, we all fell. It's the Bible's teaching in Romans chapter 5, and now we are lame in both our feet. Our lives then, apart from the great mercy of God, are lives in a condition of misery. Which brings us now in the second place to a demonstration of mercy. And under this heading, I, I want us to focus in upon, not so much Mephibosheth, though he's obviously going to be here, but focusing on King David and his actions toward Mephibosheth and how this so marvellously points us to God's gracious dealings with individual sinners that he saves. Notice the demonstration of mercy here in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and there are just three ways I want us to see it. Firstly, the initiative he showed. Have a look and see how the whole story begins in chapter 9. Look at the first three words. See how the story starts? Now David said. Mephibosheth didn't seek out the king in his residence in the palace there in Jerusalem that, that, that the king may bestow mercy upon him. Mephibosheth didn't go and say something to David in the first place. Where's Mephibosheth? He's in a place of obscurity, Lodabar on the other side of the Jordan. He stayed far away. Mephibosheth didn't seek the king. It's the king, it's King David who made the first move. David made the inquiry, not Mephibosheth. Again, it's verse 3 that says, Then David said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul in whom I may show the kindness of God? David's acting like a good shepherd. He went pursuing a lost sheep. 
as is the case with real sheep. Without the shepherd taking the initiative, the lost sheep, they will never be found. They'll never get their way back home. They don't have that ability. You see, friends, here we begin to see why I believe it's uh, described in verse 3 when it talks about the kindness that David was wanting to show to a descendant of Jonathan, why it calls that kindness what it does. Look at what it how it's described, how David's language is in verse 3. Is there not still someone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? He wants to display, he wants to exercise, he wants to demonstrate, he wants to show the kindness of God. You see, in this way, it shows us something of God's character. It's the way of God to take the initiative. It's always been like that. It was God who came to Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve had sinned. It was God who walked through the garden and called out, Adam, where are you? It wasn't Adam that said as he walked around the garden, God, where are you? God took the initiative. Where was Adam? He was in Lodabar. He was hiding. He was wanting to stay away from God. It was God who took the initiative. It was God who called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees. It wasn't Adam, Abram who called out to God. It was God who called out to Moses from that burning bush. Moses. Moses. It was God who came in Acts chapter 9 and knocked Saul of Tarsus off his high horse on the way to persecute the Christian church. God takes the initiative. And friends, without the initiative of God, no one would ever seek him. And again, that is the teaching of the Bible. Romans chapter 3 clearly says, there is none who seek after God. It's describing man's sinful condition. There's none who is righteous. There's none who does good. And in the process of saying all those things, it says, there is none who seeks after God. The activity of David in this story is a wonderful picture of King Jesus, the Good Shepherd. You turn with me in your Bibles to the New Testament, to Luke chapter 15, where we go to that parable about the lost sheep I think we see something of an illustration even back on this Old Testament story. Luke 15, verse 4. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Notice that he has to keep looking till he finds it. He will not find his way back. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. The Lord takes the initiative. He goes and he finds lost sheep. And when he finds them, he puts them on his shoulders and he carries them home. It's a wonderful image. Is there an injury in that little sheep? Perhaps there is. Perhaps they're lame. He carries them on their shoulders all the way home. He's taken the initiative. He continues to seek and to seek until he finds them and then he brings them home to the safety of the fold. If you are truly born again, God has taken the initiative with you. If God had never taken the initiative with you, then you would have never come to salvation. Or you might come to church that you would never come to salvation. And I would think that there would be some here this morning who would still be lost in their addiction to drugs, their addiction to alcohol and sexual sins. And it's very possible, speaking humanly, that some of you, if God didn't take the initiative with you, some of you would be dead now. But God did take the initiative. And for others of us, well, we'd probably still be in church, but we would be lost in a barren religion if God didn't take the initiative with us. Bless God. 
Many of us can say and testify that God has taken the initiative. Our stories about conversion are all slightly different. They're not the same of one another. But there are some things that would be the same. The Spirit came and opened our eyes and helped us to see our great need and the wonders of Christ. The Spirit came to you. He came to me. Maybe differently, but He came and He opened up our deaf ears that we might hear what we maybe we'd heard in one sense all our lives, but we didn't really listen. God came and He gave us the gift of faith that we might believe what some of us had heard from our earliest days but had rejected. We see then that God's mercy is demonstrated as he takes the initiative to save sinners as David took the initiative in dealing with Mephibosheth, according to verse 3, showing the kindness of God. But another aspect of the demonstration of mercy is the faithfulness he owed. Again, I draw your attention to what the language is. Now notice verse 1 with what it was David did say. I draw your attention to the fact that he said it initially, but now look at what he says. Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now that word kindness has the idea not just of being thoughtful, it's the idea of covenant faithfulness. Hesed is the Hebrew word. We need to understand that here we see the initiative David took to show this kindness to this Mephibosheth man. It was not done because of anything great in Mephibosheth. It wasn't done because of something worthy in the man Mephibosheth. It all had to do with a promise. It all had to do with a covenant that had been made long ago, way before Mephibosheth was even born. Long before Mephibosheth was conceived in his mother's womb. Long before they wrote his name, whatever the name was on his birth certificate, long before the little toddler could still walk and Jonathan, his dad, was coming home from battle and he'd run out the tent and he'd greet his dad. Long before that, there was a covenant established. You turn with me back to 1 Samuel chapter 20 and we'll reread the the promise, the, the covenant agreement, the serious oath that was made. That's made between Jonathan and David in 1 Samuel chapter 20. David is speaking to Jonathan. He asks the question in verse 11, who will tell me? It's about the issues that relate to Saul and the problem that David's feeling uncomfortable. Jonathan's not so sure that there's a problem. Verse 11 says, Jonathan said to David, come, let us go into the field. Get away for a private conversation. So both of them went out into the field. Then Jonathan said to David, The Lord God of Israel is witness. When I have sounded out my father sometime tomorrow or the third day, and indeed there is is good toward David, and I do not send to you and tell you, may the Lord do so, and much more to Jonathan. But if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I will report it to you and send you away that you may go in safety. And the Lord be with you as he has been with my father and you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live that I may not die but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever no not from the Lord has not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth so so Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies Now Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. That's the covenant, that's the promise. When we get to 2 Samuel chapter 9, David shows Mephibosheth kindness. In the end, not because there was something worthy in Mephibosheth, but because of the covenant promise. It was because David remained faithful to the agreement that he had with Jonathan that Mephibosheth received mercy. Here again, friends, we see another aspect, I think, of the kindness of God. For this points to God's faithful covenant with his people. The only reason sinners receive kindness from God is not because there's anything worthy in them. We've seen that already. 
it's because of God's faithfulness to his own covenant promise you say well what covenant promise well there was an agreement made in eternity past an agreement between the father and the son they entered into covenant with one another there was an agreement even before the world began that re- that was in relation to the plan of salvation salvation for Adam's fallen race the reason any sinner receives mercy is because God remains faithful to his own promise a promise that was made before we were born a promise that connects with Jesus coming to this earth and dying so when Jesus came to this earth as part of the fulfillment of that promise he made with his father that covenant before time he's fulfilling his role in the accomplishment of the covenant of redemption remember what he said right to the end of his ministry in John chapter 17 he's actually praying to the father he says father I have finished the work which you have given me to do when Jesus shed his blood on the cross and he's about to give up his life there as he hungs what's he say what's one of the things he says right at the end it is finished that word has the idea it stands completed nothing more needs to be added nothing more can be added in other words Jesus could have simply been expressing from that very word I have accomplished eternal redemption soon we're going to come to this table it's a reminder of the cost the cost to secure your salvation the story of David's merciful dealings with Mephibosheth points us to God's covenant faithfulness there are three things I believe we can see the demonstration of the mercy of God here through this story the initiative he showed the faithfulness he owed and the last thing this morning the provision that flowed you think about this fellow Mephibosheth I'm sure he couldn't believe what was happening when he arrived at the royal palace think of all the provisions that flowed for that man formerly he was a member of the family who were the enemy of of David he was a man who for years was cut off from the king he was living in isolation he was in obscurity from the king but we read in verse 11 this is David's attitude he said his attitude this man's going to eat at my table what's he going to be like he says he shall be like one of the king's sons Mephibosheth comes and says I'm your servant and David says no you're my son I treat you as a son one John 3 verse 1 behold what manner the manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God sinners who were once enemies of God cut off from the king of heaven living in isolation and obscurity as it were living as if the kingdom didn't even exist living in our own little world but then through the mercy of the king we're made children of God behold what manner of love that that could be the case that through Christ everyone here today every one of us has the potential to be a son of the king some of you maybe are not a son of the king you're still living in low Dubai you're cut off from the king you have the potential every one of you to be a son of the king because the mercy of God is so large that he would even forgive your sins what incredible mercy but friends the thing I want us to home in on as we close this morning is actually the table I'll just draw your attention again to verse 11 and listen to what the king says David says what his, in, his uh, intention is it's right toward the end of that verse now as for Mephibosheth I knew I was going to do that somewhere he said he said the king he shall eat at my table and not just once 
He shall eat continually. He shall eat always, it says throughout the passage. And then the summary in verse 13, it's the closing scene. It's how we leave the scene. Look at verse 13. Mephibosheth dwelled in Jerusalem. He's not in Lodabar anymore. He's not in a pastoralist place. He's not in a barren place. He's in a prosperous place. There he is in Jerusalem. What's he doing? He ate continually at the king's table. And he was lame in both his feet. It's like as if he's saying, well, don't forget, he's still lame. He went from the place of no pasture and he came to a table that he couldn't probably believe his eyes as a man to see all that food and all that bounty. Constantly, sumptuously fed at the king's table. Though he was cut off before from the king, now he had constant fellowship and direct access to the king. There must have been days that this man pinched his legs, <laughs> if he had feeling in his legs. There must have been days when he just thought, I've got to be dreaming. Am I still in Loda Bar and I'm in one of my afternoon naps dreaming about life, what it could be like? There must have been days when he thought, this is some sort of mad thing was happening. It's almost good, too good to be true. A man with his past receiving such provisions that flowed. Here he was sitting at the bountiful table. But where were his crippled feet, friends? It's a lovely image. The last section of this chapter. He's eating continually at the king's table and he was lame in both his feet. He came to the table, the cripple. Those crippled feet were there, but they were under the table. They were out of sight. They were under the table as if they didn't exist. And this is the point, friends. Mephibosheth's crippled feet were hidden under David's kindness. They're still there, but they're hidden. They're out of sight because of the mercy of the king. You see what a wonderful picture the Holy Spirit is painting for us here. This is tremendous. Mephibosheth has had restored a forfeited inheritance. The inheritance that had long belonged, originally belonged to Saul. He'd been lost to his family. And in a similar way, through Adam's apostasy, we lost our inheritance. But it's restored to God's people, not for Jonathan's sake, but for Christ's sake, for the Son's sake. The barrenness of the world. That was once the experience of all the people of God before conversion. But due to God's demonstration of mercy, the banqueting table becomes the reality for God's covenant people. Not occasionally, but always, forever into the future. That's like the scene here. It just continues on at the end of this chapter. We go from the place of no pasture as soon as and we come to the king's banqueting table. And there at the table, we have crippled feet, friends. Our legs are out of sight, though. For in Christ, all our deformities are hidden. Others might criticize. Others may be quick to point out uh, our deformities, but not God, for our deformities are hidden in Christ. We at times might have the tendency that we want to look down under the table and we see our feet and we get all discouraged and down, but they are hidden in Christ. And we need to focus upon God's great mercy. That is the initiative He showed, the faithfulness He owed, and the provision that flowed. Now, all of this is heading us in this direction this morning we're coming to the table this table I would suggest to you in another sense is a place of banquet for the souls of God's people this is the Lord's table it's called in the scriptures could we not call it this morning the king's table no we're not thinking of all the lavish provisions we're not thinking of what it looks like it's just an average plain 
piece of furniture and the emblems are pretty insignificant in one sense on a human level. We're not thinking of that, are we? We're thinking what it represents for us. We're thinking of what it reminds us of. We're thinking of where it points us. This table is there to remind us of what it cost Jesus in order that God's mercy should be extended to undeserved sinners like us. This is a table for cripples. That's who it's for. It's for cripples. It's for sinners. Now, some people have the idea that they think that they can invite themselves to this table. Some people have the idea, well, it's church and this is what you do in church so I can just help myself to these things on this table. People that often think that way are, are normally the ones who think that they can actually walk in the ways of God and that God will accept them. And that they could, as it were, walk, continue to walk through life as they have been and walk all the way after they die up through the pearly gates into heaven. I think their religion, their good living, is enough to make them acceptable to God. But that thinking doesn't understand the Bible, what the Bible says. Because the Bible teaches us that whatever our goodness is, however good we might think our goodness is, it is not good enough for the perfect God. And such thinking doesn't realise that there's a problem with our feet, that we have lame feet all of us you see it's not our goodness that is needed is it it's God's goodness in Christ that we all need people who have not embraced Jesus Christ put it bluntly are actually not invited to this table this is a table for the Lord's people to come to for the sons of the king to participate of the banquet that he has provided for them. It's not for those who still live in Lodabar. It's for those who have come under the mercy of God. It's a table for cripples. It's a table for those that Jesus has washed away their sins in his own blood. It's a table for those who have had their sins forgiven. Or the analogy that we spoke about before, we sung about before. It's a table for those who were like wandering sheep. That the good shepherd went out after, seeking and seeking until he found them. And he picked them up on his shoulders and he carries them home. And now those crippled feet are hidden under the Lord's table. Those deformities are out of sight when God looks. Because God doesn't see those deformities. God sees his son. He sees the beauty and the righteousness of Christ when he looks on his people. So the focus of this table is the king's marvellous provision for those who are unworthy to be seated at the table. You imagine the gratitude that was in Mephibosheth's heart. Each time he came to that table, I'm sure as the years rolled on, the gratitude remained strong. Maybe it even grew as he grew to understand the significance of all that had happened for him. Isn't that true for us as Christians? The longer we are Christians, it ought to be our gratitude grows. It intensifies as we grow and understand all that was involved that we could be now called children of God. We therefore need to be coming to this table this morning with hearts full of gratitude. Our spiritually crippled feet hidden under the mercy and provision of Christ. Yes, we're sinners, but there was a sinless Saviour. Our sins washed away in his blood and his righteousness accredited to our account. That's why we are invited, welcomed, commanded to come to the table as the people of God to receive these emblems to help us remember all the provision that is ours in Christ. Amen and may the Lord help us now as we come to this table to have those
hearts full of gratitude.